Okay, so here's here's the icebreaker that we'll get started with. Okay. So, and I heard this uh, over over the past weekend. There's a there's a this has nothing to do with an introduction aside that this is an icebreaker to the introduction. A husband and wife are um, married 50 years, and the husband and wife never argued one time in 50 years. So the husband was interviewed, and they said, "How did you were you married? Are married 50 years without one argument?" So he said it's very simple. He said, when we were married, we had horses in a carriage outside waiting for us. And when we got into the carriage, the horse didn't move. So his wife went to the horse to the face and said, that's one. Well, the horse and carriage went a little bit further, and the horse stops again. The wife gets out of the carriage, goes up to the horse, and she says, that's two. Well, the horse goes a little bit further, stops. The wife gets out and shoots the animal dead right then and there. And the husband says, honey, you can't just shoot an animal like that. And she said, that's one. So that's our little, <laughs> our little introduction. To uh, to introductions and lit reviews. So I see we've only we've only lost three people over that little joke there. So evidently married too long or too short. Or I'm not sure what. Okay, so let's just get started here. Um, thank you all for joining. We're going to take questions throughout. You can type in your questions in the chat window um, to to the uh, in the chat window. And then my uh, able assistant, my Sadies, will, uh, will will then forward me those questions and we'll take it from there. Okay. So without further ado, so here is a dissertation kind of globally, right? So it's broken up into four broad parts: intro and lit review, methodology, results, and discussion. Typically, if you were with me last time, I, I say to get to the methodology first, even though it's the second part, and to get to the methodology because you actually know what you're conducting. That is, you have research questions that are able to be examined. You have instruments or materials that you're able to administer. You have participants and the ability to um, get, get your hands on them. And you have a data plan and a way to kind of analyze the data to examine those questions. So if you missed last times, uh, you can you can catch the methodology. Um, it's online, and, and you can replay that if you'd like. So tonight, uh, we're going to talk about introduction and lit review. And then uh, in, in subsequent sections, we'll talk about results and discussion chapter. OK. So the introduction. So this is the time to grab the reader's attention. If you if, have you started a book and you thought you can't get into it, I like poetry. If those first few lines don't grab me, I'm not going through the rest of the poem. And similarly with books or any kind of material. I mean, how long do you have to, how much of a cake do you have to eat after the first few tastes that you say, I don't like this cake? You're not going to finish the cake and then say, boy, that was a terrible piece of cake. You're going to stop. So you need to get people's attention quickly. So what are you studying? Why is this important? You got to jump to that. And you better, so the reader of interest here, let's just be clear, the reader of interest is your committee. So you need to have their attention, what you're doing, why it's important, what you're going to measure, and how you're going to do this thing. If you do not have their attention, again, you're, you're going to have a tainted view going throughout. And when they have that lingering question in their mind, they probably will not be attending 
to what else they're reading because that's going to be driving them back. Why are we doing this? Asking that why question they're bringing. Now, if you have a very clear stated, this is what we're doing, here's a significant part of it, that's answered. They're going to be like, great, we should be doing this now. How are we going to do it? Who are we going to do it with? How is it going to be presented? All of that kind of business, that's fine. But get out that significance early on. Give people a context, an overview of what's happening. Tell them the variables of interest or constructs. And give them a brief, you know, how we're going to do this. All right. So the lit review, this is more kind of lit review stuff, but but it, but it, it's it's good for both lit review and the introduction. So the lit review is really you know surveying the literature around your topic, what's been done from the seminal work to what's been done in recent publications. You want to be able to capture that um, as concisely as possible in your lit review. Heads up though. The literature review is, and I'm jumping ahead just a bit here, so apologies for that. The literature review is more than just a review of the literature, though. The literature review is really you building an argument for why this study needs to be conducted. So as you go from a, and we'll talk more about this when we get into the literature review formally here. So as you build from a global kind of topic, let's just say looking at self-esteem by gender, and you're talking about self-esteem and all the different kinds of measures, and you're talking about gender differences and the way that those can kind of uh, be exhibited, okay? And then closer things of people measuring self-esteem or other kinds of self-efficacy by gender. You're building an argument for why you need to be conducting your study with this population at this time using these instruments. So it's more than just a review. There needs to be a sequence and a, I'll say, a targeting of your research questions as you move on down at Hourglass. All righty. Writing skills matter. Uh, we'll just go back up to critical thinking, all right? That argument has to be good. If, if when your committee is reading through your introduction or in your literature review, and there's still like, um, your, your argument is not strong, that is showing gaps of the literature along the way, then um, th they're not going to buy into it. And the extent they don't buy into it, it winds up costing you time. And when it winds up costing you time, it winds up costing you money because you're sitting in school longer and you don't have the opportunity to make the additional money or capitalize on the raise that you're all going to be getting at work. So you, so you want a strong argument. OK. Um, what else? Writing skills make a difference. I mean, things have to be organized. A you have to have decent, if you have to have decent writing skills, or you need to hire someone with decent writing skills. And I'm not being critical. I'm just stating if you don't have clear topic sentences and then um, sentences in a paragraph that are supporting that topic sentence, or if you're kind of willy-nilly all over the place, that's not going to help your case. Once you lose the reader, you're done. When the committee member reads the first five paragraphs and they make edits to your grammar or writing style or whatever it is that you have there and and then stop giving you feedback, that's a clue they got tired and they're not going to keep reading. So they're going to say, check out your grammar, check out your reading skills along the way. Um, for those who want a, just a, a good little book on reading skills, it's called Little English Handbook by... Uh, Cobert and Finkel, C-O-R-B-E-T-T -T and Finkel, F-I-N-K-L-E. 
and it goes into uh, coherence, uh, the mechanisms of writing, grammar, um, paragraphing in terms of, of, of development and unity of that paragraph. That's going to go a heck of a long way. In fact, during my dissertation, there was there was several stages, and I guess I appreciate it now, begrudgingly so. But I mean, I had to read each each paragraph back from the bottom of the paragraph, sentence by sentence, all the way up. So each sentence had to hold by itself, had to stand by itself, reading it backwards. Then I had to read over each paragraph in my introduction and literature review and say, what's the basic topic of that paragraph? Okay, And the rest of that paragraph better have been consistent around that topic. And then sequence each one of those topics and make sure they're in the right order. So there's several levels of this thing, and it's, it's a little painstaking. And there's an old saying that hard writing makes for easy reading. That's what you want because when the reader is not, when the reader is having a tough time reading over it, it's going to cost you a month of your life because they're going to sit on it for two weeks and you're going to sit on it for two weeks making those edits. And those months add up and we want everyone to graduate this year, early 2016, right? Right. So either go through those exercises literally sentence by sentence paragraph by paragraph, and or hire an editor to do that. Okay, and it could be us, it could be someone else, but get the support that you need, lest you wind up spending more time in, in the process than you need to. Okay, staying in charge of your study. Look, we only have so much control of what's happening here. The committees have the magic pen. I got that. Having said that, you know, when things aren't right, things aren't right, and you need to voice that. For example, my committee chair had said, when I was doing that paragraph by paragraph, put paragraph two after one, and then after a few weeks, put one after two. So he switched it back, and I, you know, obviously had to push back with his email and say, you know, I'm happy to do whatever you want to do, but just let me know. In the meantime, I just wasted two weeks of my life because he wanted it back the initial way, right? <laughs> so uh, to the extent that you can, you know, stay organized, address their comments clearly, and what I mean by that is you should be addressing, first of all, committee members have very good memories. All right. Committee members and women have very good memories. Let me just you know generalize that to the to everyone to to the to the female gender. You not they're not going to forget what's happening here. You if you have when they make a comment on your paper, you need to address their comment in in the paper itself, but you also need to address the comment in an email. So it goes something like this. Dear Dr. So-and-so, I received your 35 comments. We're going to address them one by one. I'm going to address them one by one. Comment one, you asked me to elaborate on this point. I've elaborated on this point in this fashion. See page 17. It tells them that you took their comment seriously and now that you've addressed it fully. There's nothing more annoying to a committee member, and when they're annoyed, no one's going to be happy. No, one, nothing's going to annoy them more than to say, and I've read it before. You have not addressed my comments. Okay, it, it, it's like disrespecting them. It's just not a good thing to do. You want to tell them, yes, I've taken you seriously. Yes, I've addressed it. So. Be, be very mindful. Don't address 34 out of the 35 comments. Address all the comments and then submit it to them. 
that's the way to get through. By the way, this is a tried and true system. The um, uh, back when I was helping my advisor, and and um, it was the, I forget the name of the journal. Anyway, he was the uh, editor in chief there, and then they sent it off to different uh, reviewers for for their feedback, and the. Uh, the researchers that got their papers published were the ones that addressed the reviewers' comments in full via in the email as well as in the document itself. So, crucial, tried and true. Okay. Um, what else? Um, for the lit review, you have to identify gaps in the literature. Gaps in the literature equal you making your argument strong. That is why I need to do this now, okay? So that's the reason why you're providing those gaps. It's not for the for the hell of it. It's because you're building your argument to say, ah, they did it with this instrument, but they didn't do it with this instrument. They did it with third graders, but not with ninth graders. They did it with what in the southeast. They didn't do it in the northwest. So you need to be able to identify what the gaps are so when you can say, I'm doing it with ninth graders in the Northwest. It hasn't been done before. Ah, okay. It makes it worthwhile. Okay. Let's carry on here. Okay, the lit review, formally. First of all, do you have any questions at all? Okay. Uh, we have one question here. Let's see if I got what I have. Um, a question from from uh, Evan. What is it? Oh, from Aaron. Okay. I'm I'm complaining about her handwriting. You should see my handwriting. Okay. So Alan says, how much of the thesis should be devoted to the intro and lit review? The truth is enough that I don't think there's any try. I don't, well, I guess there's a couple ways of answering that, I, and it shouldn't just be for a master's thesis, but also for a doctoral uh, dissertation. I guess that there's some rules of thumbs about the number of pages. That if you have an introduction or a lit review, that's Let's just take lit review. If you have a lit review that's one page long, um, one of two things are, or one of a few things are occurring. One, you're in a brand new field, and if you're in a brand new without literature, and if you're in a brand new field that does not have literature, okay, I'm going to say if you want to get out in the next seven years, switch your topic. You don't want to break new ground. You want to just modify the existing ground, okay? So if the lit review is too short um, and there's no materials out there, you're breaking ground, I'd say switch it up. The Or there's literature out there and you haven't done your homework and, and done a thorough search, which, by the way, statistic solutions can assist with lit review searches. So heads up there. So okay, so um, so it, I mean it needs to be thorough enough. Again, you need to kind of, you know, for the introduction, whatever it's going to take to show significance. Perhaps um, you know the the basic design of the study. Why you know why it's important that you're doing this and so forth. And the review needs to be thorough. That you need to discuss some of the seminal work and then drill down into some of the um, literature that's dealing with your topics, using your instruments with, with your kind of participants. And then you need just a small twist on that. So we'll, we'll get into the things that need to be in there. And um, I guess it's, uh, I guess it's a, a fine enough time to state that for everyone here, that you can all receive a, a dissertation template in that, and that goes for the master's thesis, Alan, that you can use the same format. In the template is the introduction and literature review with all of the different paragraphs. Okay. 
of what needs to be included in all of them. So as long as you're capturing each of these topics in, in the introduction and being thorough about the lit review from very global, I'll say, you know, wide angle shots to very narrow, you know, tight angle shots, um, you know, you should be in good shape. And if I had to uh, err on one side or the other, I think I would rather have more than less. I know that sounds um, wasteful, but it's but it's much more it's it's much easier to prune and then to start cherry picking when you're building that argument when you have something to cherry pick from. So I would say the. Um, um, uh, do do more than than less. Okay. Okay. The lit review is providing a context for the study. Okay. You know what's been done before. Um, it's empirical, that is observable, and logical. It makes sense and it's flowing. And as I said earlier, you're really building an argument in that lit review, in addition to reviewing the literature. And as I state here, you're answering why the study needs to be conducted. Okay. That needs to be really clear. And when people are reading those paragraphs, they need to be able to reflect on how this all fits in together. Or some con you know, some conclusion to your different sections about let's just take the self efficacy and gender. Hey, this section in lit review talked about different gender differences, some of which are whatever, cognitive, physical, whatever, social, emotional, you know. So you need, you know, so you need to be summarizing these different in the spirit of making it um, good, understandable uh, um, lit reviews, pieces of that, you know, subheadings are enormously helpful. Hey. I'm going to talk about all the gender differences. I'm going to talk about all the self-efficacy, different types of study, different ways that people have measured this, and when that started, and when that came up for, let's just say, psychologists or education psychologists. So uh, different subheadings are going to be helpful, and then perhaps some subheadings that are sharing, hey, this is how self-efficacy and gender differences are kind of intermingled. So good, coherent argument all the way through. Okay. All righty. When looking at articles, uh, we should just talk briefly about searching, reading, organizing, and writing about them. And we'll go into each one of these things. Okay, so uh, in searching articles, uh, keywords obviously matter. So um, when when you're when you're searching, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of ways of looking at self-efficacy. So if we typed in self-efficacy into a a psych lit or other kind of database, there may be other kinds of words that people are using for it. So you want to look uh, broad. I would say broadly. I, what are the uh, synonyms people are using for self-efficacy? The sources that you use, you have to use things that people will respect. I mean, uh, as a colleague has said here, and I've been using uh, at home recently, you know, cite your sources. You, you have to have peer-reviewed sources. Yes, personal communications are good. You know. To, let me just say something about that, that um, academics are enormously available people. You can contact these people. And they, you call them, they answer the phone. You email them, they'll answer your emails. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So, so personal communications do matter. Having said that, aside from that, 
you know, go to um, obviously you have to use peer-reviewed sources, and um, you know what the top journals are in your field. Use those. Um, start with recent articles. We'll talk about citation chaining in a moment. You'll want to, um, particularly the review articles. I'm going to jump back up. The when you're searching, you know, if you find a um, for example, I think it's uh, psych, uh, a psychological review is the name of the is the name of the journal. And if you have someone a you know someone in that field that's looking at the review of self-efficacy, that's fantastic. They're doing a hell of a lot of homework for you. They're going back to the first person who coined that phrase all the way up to the most recent articles around that. So review articles are really going to help you make sure that you are crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's in terms of that trajectory of that topic over time in your field. So look for those review articles. And obviously, the most recent articles are, are going to be important. You want to see what's been done. You know, articles, you know, they're always going to be a year out, right? So then they're not, it um, takes time for them to get published and accepted and reviewed. And so, but nevertheless, um, even an article a year or so out uh, would be great. Good reference librarians are invaluable. They know how to search things, and good researchers know how to search things too. When I was uh, in my, well, it was before my master's, and I was not a very good librarian at the time. <laughs> and, but I, I remember going to a professor and mentioning the topic, and he was up on a topic, and he had like the perfect article there. And I'm like, how did you have that? You know, he had it on the tip of his fingers. So having good reference librarians are enormously helpful. Okay, and uh, let me ask a few, uh, answer a few questions here. Um, okay, so Patricia uh, asked, uh, how much contrary material should be included in the lit review? Well, the contrary material is great because it's helping you build that, that, that argument why, hey, author uh, A, B, and C have found this. Authors D, E, and F have found a, a contrary finding. Therefore, we need to conduct a study to kind of uh, come to some conclusion about it. Or we need to do a meta-analysis. Or we need to look at it uh, w with fresh eyes, with a fresh instrument. So the uh, as, as much as you need to make the argument, I don't think these things need to be completely exhaustive. I think they need to build an argument where people's heads are nodding uh, in the affirmative and uh, they're moving your project along. So I hope that answers it. The um, Adrian asks, uh, how best should we structure our lit review matrix? In order to identify the key points of divergence and or gaps in the existing literature. Well, again, I mean, I think, you know, think about subheadings. Think about, you know, what's your, um, let's just take that one. Uh, can we unmute uh, Adrian? Yeah, hello, Adrian. Hi, Adrian. Let's see here. We'll give it to uh, Adrian. If you can unmute yourself or if you could talk, that'd be great. So, or does someone else want to? Uh, so I, I just don't know what the topic is. Um, if someone else wants to uh, chime in about uh, what the topic is, we could talk about how to structure that. But I mean, just take my simple example of self-efficacy and gender differences and do a section on self-efficacy, do a section on gender differences, 
do a section on the combination of them and then cut to why you need to be looking at that. Okay. So, <coughs> excuse me. So search strategies, identify databases, obviously. <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Uh, you need the right search terms. And you should be, and by the way, when you're finding some articles that are really capturing what you want, look at their look at their search terms, look at their keywords that they've put in there, which is listed right underneath the abstract, typically. When you're searching, um, sometimes there are very few uh, articles to be found, in which case you need to expand, or there's a thousand of them, in which case you need an arrow. Citation chaining, um, let me just see if I can just jump ahead to that for a second. Citation chaining is kind of like this. When you find a, let's just take that center circle for a moment. When you find a relevant uh, article, you can go back and see, um, you know, what what the articles, uh, who, who they've all cited, aside from their reference list. Um, and then also you can go forward to say who has since referenced it. So basically you can get the references that were cited, um, who has cited them, and then um, I'm not articulating myself particularly well. The idea is that you can see who's all cited each other there to help you follow the chain of that argument. And you can look at their arguments as well to see how they've uh, rationalized um, or uh, there was a rationale for that particular study. All right, I want to go back now. So, okay. So, um, identify databases. What are the, what are the uh, you know, um, most respected databases in the field? Okay, what are the best terms to describe that topic? Expanding and narrowing, we just talked about if you have too many, you're going to need filters uh, to, to help boil it down. Otherwise, you need, for example, by Andy, by uh, adding um, uh, different Boolean logic. So, for example, if you're if you're studying um, self-efficacy and gender differences on self-efficacy, and you come up with a, with with that you know the thousand a thousand and one articles, okay, well gosh, then look at and you want to study ninth graders. Well, then you're going to have to put in whatever that is you know plus high school to narrow down and, and see if you can boil down the articles that are really relevant. So that's what I mean by a filter, is that kind of Boolean searches. Okay. Um, okay, so Renee said, um, I like my topic to be self-efficacy of female entrepreneurs. Okay, so good. And innovative measures. How would that be structured? Okay, so can we talk to Renee? Yeah, hi, Renee. I'm here. Hey, Hello. welcome. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So, okay, so your inclusion criteria, I presume, are female entrepreneurs. Is that true? Yes. Mm -hmm. Female entrepreneurs okay. and then also including something with strategy and innovation. Okay. And what, what about strategy and innovation? Can you say I more about that? Apply like some of the innovation theories are probably talking about things like, you know, competitive advent, um, competitive advantage or uh, incremental innovation, and apply them to like small business owners or small okay. or medium sized businesses. Okay, so what's the research question at hand? 
I don't know. I'm still trying to narrow that. <laughs> so okay. um, I think I'm just I'm going to do something on um, the self-efficacy of uh, female entrepreneurs and business. And I think that what I'm going to probably have to do is I'm going to have to do the difference between men and women to do a quantitative study. Okay, I'm sorry, you want to do a quantitative study? Yes. Okay, all right. Um, okay, so, okay, so fine. So you, so you have a lot of good stuff here. So, um, for, first of all, the constructs of self-efficacy, um, there's lots of measures of self-efficacy. So, and this is really covered in the methodology webinar, but the the idea that you can you have some you have some way of getting at self efficacy. You could look at it by gender. The I guess a, a question that would arise for me it would be um, well people looked at have looked at self efficacy um, by by gender. Why is this study going to be different or important? So that's the kind of question you could say, well, maybe, maybe it's of all entrepreneurs, you know, or maybe it's entrepreneurs that are in the 30 to 50 year range or maybe older entrepreneurs or younger entrepreneurs. Originally, the, like, the population that I wanted to use was female veterans. And okay. I feel like when I go up against the board, I may have a little bit of difficulty getting it through since um, they may feel that, that that's such a small population. But what I wanted to do was tie into that population the fact that, you know, they're highly trainable and, um, you know, very capable, but they exist yeah. in a very um, bureaucratic organization or they come from that. So sometimes they don't understand. They, they're more so go off of tradition than innovation. Right. Okay. Um, okay. So let me just let me just understand it. So, is the question something like, are there differences on self-efficacy by um, by the? Um, let me just rephrase that. For veteran entrepreneurs, well, entrepreneurs that are veterans. <laughs> For entrepreneurs that are veterans, are there differences on self-efficacy by gender? Is that getting that, at it? That sounds pretty good. Yeah, I can. I was either thinking about doing that or just saying if, if there's a different self-efficacy between women that aren't uh, veterans and women that are. So I think I can go either way with it. I like that too. Okay, and the, the, are they all entrepreneurs? Pardon and me? it's actually, I said, yes, they would all be entrepreneurs. Okay. And I said, actually, um, in my research, I found that there's actually an entrepreneurial self-efficacy scale that's been, um, been developed. Oh, perfect. I love it. So, okay, so, so let's just get the question down. So, so for, um, for entrepreneurs, for female entrepreneurs, are there differences on self-efficacy by group, veterans versus non-veterans? Yes. Okay, I like that. Okay, good. And then perhaps you can use this competitive advantage or these other things as kind of the theories in which to view that. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry, I just don't know enough about competitive advantage uh, theory. Uh, or, or 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 innovative uh, theories to kind of speak to that, but the it, it sounds like there's a question brewing there now. So good good start. One thing that um, that everyone should really keep in mind is that um, you you really want a few questions, okay? You you want more than one question. And uh, there's a few ways of doing it. Can you um, help me introduce another variable into this thing? 
let's just say we have one variable, one, one construct, self-efficacy. We have the other variable, which is uh, veteran just no. Can, can, you, uh, can you give me another variable or construct that would, that would be in the mix there? Perhaps age differences or perhaps region of the country or perhaps whatever. Is there some uh, is there another so variable that would, might mix in? Age would be a good one. And the reason why age is a good one is because of the fact that there's been such an increase in the number of female veterans nationally. Most of them yeah. have come from uh, post 9-11, um, the post 9-11 era. So yeah. either age or classification by the campaigns that they served in may actually be able to, you know, further deconstruct. Got it. Got it. So one way to add another question, okay, without collecting too, too much more data, but another research question that could be added is that, um, let me just back up for a second, that um, there are things called um, moderating variables and mediating variables. And moderating variables strengthen or weaken the relationship between two variables. So what I mean by that is that it could well be that, hey, there's a relationship between veteran status, yes, no, and self-efficacy, and that perhaps um, age moderates that, that is to say that perhaps um, the younger you are, the stronger the relationship, or could we can hypothesize it the other way. So, so for everyone that's looking to build another question, um, out of that, so you can have your one one main question: differences on self-efficacy by uh, uh, by group, veteran versus not. And then you can have another question: Hey, does age moderate the relationship between veteran status and self-efficacy? So that's another way to kind of drill into it. Okay. The um, uh, okay, so that's a start. I was just uh, other, just other quick thoughts is, you know, even even looking at just the um, you talked about <clears throat> veterans in the in the post um, nine eleven uh, types that you know is there a difference in self efficacy by <clears throat> by pre or post nine eleven. Uh, era, so so there's a few questions brewing. So you started off with this kind of, I'll say, beginning question or broad question: differences on efficacy by veteran status. Then you're asking a second question: Does age, you know, moderate the relationship between veteran status and self-efficacy? And then you could say, just for the veteran group. Uh, are there differences on self-efficacy by pre and post 9-11? Okay. So th these are some ways of kind of developing questions. All right. You good with that? Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, good luck with it. It, it, sounds, it does sound interesting. So uh, carry on. Are you a veteran? I am. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your service. Welcome back. We 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 give a. Uh, I will I will. Uh, we we do give discounts for veterans. You know. You can tell my staff I said so. Um, so if you run into <laughs> trouble, give us a holler. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. That's good to know. Thank you so much. <laughs> All right, Renee. Good speaking with you. So. Those are, those are ways of um, developing questions. And um, so now, now I'll answer her question, what she wanted, which was, how do I structure, now let's think about this, how do I structure the, and I should have kept her online here, 
how do I structure the lip review? So we're going to have a whole section about self-efficacy. That's the first thing. We're going to have a whole section about veterans and veteran and veteran groups, veterans versus non-veterans, and the differences in all different domains, maybe around the way that they respond to structure or something of this sort. Okay, and then you're going to have difference within group differences. That is, the veterans, what differences exist within that group? Okay, so you're laying those out piece by piece, self-efficacy, differences by veteran versus not, differences within veteran, age differences in self-efficacy, age differences within veterans, and then to say, gosh, we need to ask these three research questions. Okay, so that's, that's one layout or one structure of, of a lit review. And you can see how we can kind of develop that. I mean, for everyone listening, I mean, we developed that all in, you know, 10 minutes, right? I mean, she came in with a, with a question, but pretty quickly we got to it. And it goes back to what, I've, what I believe, which is people really know what they want to ask. So, um, and, and, you know, Renee was right there with it. So um, that's how you can start developing things. Don't spend two months figuring out your questions and figuring out how you're going to lay it out. Get, the questions are critical, but get, you know, either, either just write them down or get the support you need okay, and get those questions nailed down. I'll say there's, there's maybe there's good questions and bad questions, but <laughs> for our purposes here, good questions are questions that the committee agree with and think are worthwhile exploring, and then and then uh, you move them forward with it. Okay. Uh, we talked about citation chaining, uh, reading one strategy. Obviously, you got to read the abstract. Read the topic sentences. The method, look at the methodology, not only for, to see what they've done and the results and what they found, but also about modeling your own methodology around that. So you don't have to start from scratch. You can really, um, you know, look at what other people have done. Be it a quantitative or qualitative analysis, you want to be able to um, you know, you know that it's that it's a reasonable methodology because it's been published in a peer review article journal. So look at that method, and, and you know, and, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel here. Is what I'm saying. Skim the discussion section. Not only to see how they put these results together in the context of that, but also about uh, future research. Okay. That's what's going to be happening in that discussion chapter. And when you're reading it, I mean, as you've done, you know, when you read articles during the your, your tenure at school there, you know, what was the problem and the question? How did they design the study? How many people did they use? Use all of those, use all of those questions and prime yourself prior to reading that article so you really grab and dig into it. And you should have a clear understanding of, you know, the so what questions. Why is this, why was this article important? Okay. Uh, organizing, keep, keep things organized. The, um, keep notes. Don't go crazy with the notes though, but have them organized. Here's self-efficacy articles. Here's differences by uh, military versus non, and here's with you know, here is age differences with with veterans. Here's age difference articles with self-efficacy. So keep them in you know good piles, but don't make a thousand piles. Okay, that's what I'm saying. The uh, the articles uh, I kind of mentioned earlier about um, a movie analogy. By the way, this was 
borrowed from someone. I, I'm not sure who to give credit to, but someone mentioned a movie analogy of long shots, which are you know articles kind of relevant to your topic, close-up shots that are very relevant to your topic. For example, a long shot would be, hey, you know what? Here are differences on self-efficacy. Okay, and very relevant shot is here's differences on self-efficacy by uh, you know by by veterans or by someone you know that is that the close-up shots have several of your variables of interest included in that study, and then the medium-range shots are you know kind of a, a, a mix of that. Organizing your searches, there's several different um, uh, management software um, that you can use. Okay. There's three of them. Writing, you don't have to uh, uh, cite everything that you've read. Um, don't quote to death when you do a plagiarism check. It came back 98%. Well, 98% of your stuff has been quoted. And of course, it's going to come up that it's been quoted before. That's one reason not to quote to death, but also it's easy enough just to kind of rephrase in your own words. Subheadings really keep people organized. Summarize those sections. Something like in conclusion uh, or in summary, you know, self-efficacy self literature, dot, dot, dot. Part of the making the e the reading easy is to have nice transitions between the paragraphs. Have it flow for the reader. You know, say of life too. Don't make don't make don't pain them by having to read your study. You know, make it flow. Make it interesting. Um, here was just a conclusion from my. Uh, own dissertation. <clears throat> um, you know, several questions were stimulated in, uh, you know, by and limitations of HW. Several questions were stimulated by one puzzling finding. A couple of limitations of study were this. I also wondered about that. Given these questions and limitations, I now present my study. So these are ways of really Priming that pump, why we need to conduct that study. Okay. Um, research questions. Here were, you know, a few of the research questions to ask. This is really less important. Qualitative research questions. You know, there's three basic um, uh, grounded theory, uh, case study, phenomenological, and uh, the kinds of questions that you should be asking um, are about the lived experiences or, you know, the, the, the uh, ground theories of, of helping to build a theory. So um, how did the process change from time to time? So different kinds of uh, research questions are more, I'll say, congruent or uh, amenable to uh, qualitative research. Hypotheses, particularly for quantitative analyses, should be clear. Okay, so um, I, we've come to the uh, to the end, or for some people, we've come to the beginning, right? Uh, getting started with this thing. So. Uh, if there are any uh, questions or answers, uh, questions, hopefully I have some of uh, the answers. We should fill in that, uh, that cloud, though, to the left of the answers. So, um, you know, in the last few minutes, I'm, I'm happy to respond to questions that people may have about the introduction and about the uh, lit review. In the meantime, I'll put a shameless plug-in uh, for the next webinar, which is free, uh, on August the 11th at 8.30 p.m. It's a just total open uh, question and answer period. So anything you have about from topic choice to committee choice, 
to some other part of the dissertation. Uh, uh, we're happy to, I'm happy to answer that. August 11th to day 30, again, that is free. What's well, not free, but uh, you could have fun in the sun in Florida, is a, uh, a day workshop I think it goes from 10 to 4, so with with a fantastic lunch included, by the way. Uh, at the Hyatt, uh, it's very close to the Tampa airport. And um, that's going from uh, 10 to 4 on August the 15th. We're kind of going to review everything from the proper attitude in approaching this project all the way through the discussion chapter and questions and answers and the whole thing, people typically have a pretty good time at it and really come out with, with some more, with some clarity. It's only $99. Uh, have, have five people sign up and you come for free. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, if you have a, some cohorts, uh, if you're in a cohort and, um, and, and you can, um, have have everybody uh, sign up and take a trip together. Yeah, come on down Saturday. Spend Saturday evening in in Tampa. There's a lot to do here, and uh, but but for sure it will forward you and then bring bring everything that you have with you with regard to you know any drafts that you have and we'll work with you individually and um, uh, and, and use you just use what you have as a uh, you know, to, to help forward you in the process. So uh, Saturday, August the 15th, uh, 10 to 4. Again, fantastic lunch, fantastic uh, snacks. Only 99 bucks. 99 bucks. That's pretty cheap. And, and um, I think JetBlue, well, I'm not sure if JetBlue goes in there or not. But uh, anyway, uh, you can also go into the Clearwater St. Pete Airport. And uh, I know Southwest goes to Tampa Airport and Florida St. Pete. You can uh, JetBlue flies in there as well as uh, um, uh, USA 3000. So you can you can find really inexpensive flights, and you still have time to make those. And we are taking reservations. How do people? Uh, so you just go to this link below, and um, uh, go to the link below, and uh, you can sign up for it there. Okay. All righty. So, okay. And any final questions? Uh, okay. So, and I'll just uh, go for a few more questions. Um, okay. Uh, Patsy, uh, why would why would you have more than one research question? The it's just a practical issue. The, if you ask one question and you do one t-test, you can have a results chapter that's a half a page long. You want a results chapter that's something that people can bite their teeth into, and you're going to want to um, have a discussion chapter that you can write something about. So just as a practical matter, it's good to have more than one research question. Um, Okay, so in, in Molly asks, uh, if you're including a list of definitions in the intro, uh, uh, how do you, which variables you include, the most important ones? I mean, the ones that are relevant. You want to keep the people, the readers, focused in on, <clears throat> on your topic. So don't distract them too, too much. You know, I, I just think, um, you know, when you look at Google, they, you know, they have a lot of white space and one bar, which is your search bar there, right? So they really keep you focused on search versus Yahoo. There's kind of all kinds of stuff going on there. So um, you, you, you want to include just really the relevant things, okay? Um, so, okay. So uh, with that, I will uh, say... Thank you. It's you know it's it's very rewarding for a speaker to have everyone kind of hang with us all the way through. So thank you all for doing that. Uh, I appreciate you being here. Um, don't forget um, visit us on the 11th. 
uh, 8.30, open Q&A. On the 15th, uh, $99 gets you a full day and most importantly, forwards you in your process in completing your dissertation, okay? Critical, we, I can be of help. And I have a great team here in, uh, who, who can assist you as well. So.